Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's continue. So just to recap a few things that the uh, transformer architecture enabled for us. We said that because now we do to the self-attention mechanism, we are mixing the uh, representations of tokens in a given sentence um, to produce a token representation at this particular spot. So these representations are now, token representations are becoming contextualized at deeper layers. That means if you have the same word, which has multiple different senses, um, we will eventually produce a token embedding for that token, like base in here, that's not gonna be exactly the same across these three different sentences. And that's a huge advantage because now we are able to capture more nuanced aspects of uh, meaning and relatedness, okay? Then we said, all right, now we now have positional embeddings, uh, which is great for uh, modeling sequence order, the order in which tokens appear without necessarily needing to process one token at a time as we needed with the recurrent neural network, where only after you have produced the token representation at the step i, you could make a representation at the step i plus one. With positional encodings, we can do this uh, production of these representations for each token a deeper layer in parallel. So this is way more computationally efficient, which is very important for scaling this model. So eventually what made the huge difference between RRNs and transformers is that transformers scale well, meaning that we can have way more layers, meaning way more weight matrices, meaning way more parameters, and we can use larger amounts of training data because we can process it faster. And this is the reason why Transformer is the backbone of large language models of today, right? Okay, long, long range dependencies was another thing we cared about. Like if there is a linguistic relation between at the beginning uh, and at the end of your sequence, and if the sequence is very long, you still want to be able to model it. I told you in theory, recurrent neural networks should be able to do this, but in practice, they are incapable of doing that. So what is accumulated in the hidden representation many steps after is actually not gonna capture information we have seen many steps before. With self-attention, that's handled because now we have self-attention and we have in our attention matrix, um, important scores between token that appeared in the beginning and a token that appeared at the end of the sequence. Okay, one thing that I have previously mentioned that is another thing we need to handle is the fact that we are using gradient descent, but our problem is not actually convex, meaning we don't have that nice, you know, convex function, like a quadratic function, where uh, every time you go down, eventually you've hit the minimum and there is a global minimum. Instead, we have these kinds of situations where we have valleys, we have saddle points and so on. So where do we start really matters. This is a terrible place to start, right? You are in a local minimum that's not super nice because it's way, the, 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 the loss is way higher here than it is here. And um, you're actually in a very flat point in that local minimum, meaning your gradient descent won't really move much, right? Like you will just be stuck in that minimum. And similarly would happen if you started here in a saddle point. So uh, we did talk about which kind of initialization we use. We, you know, it was still a random initial initialization, except that uh, you draw the random numbers that are in a certain interval of possible numbers, not any random number. But other than that, we didn't do much. We still had randomly initialized weights. And this is the thing we are gonna talk about today. How to start from a really nice point in this landscape such that we can model a lot of NLP tasks if we train a model from that point. Okay, so just continuing on that motivation, I wanna remind you what do we do when we have a standard supervised machine learning. This is just a basically re-saying what I just said. We have our data, which is labeled data in supervised machine learning, where we start with some text and they have labels. 
In your homework, we work with sentences that come from some movie reviews and they are labeled as positive and negative. Right now, when you are training your neural networks in your second assignment, you are starting with randomly initialized parameters for your linear layers and so on, right? They are just random numbers that occur in these matrices that you then tweak using the gradient descent. Okay, so this one here is random. And then after many epochs, after many steps of gradient descent, you get a neural network whose weights are now different and they are specialized for that task. So at the prediction time, you can get, for example, in this example, uh, whether a spam is, uh, excuse me, whether an email is spam or not. Now, I said that this is not super nice uh, when we start with these random weights because we can end up in this uh, local minima that are not really good or at saddle points. So what had happened in two, 2018, that was a major big improvement in NLP and then therefore in the larger AI space is this idea to prepare the model uh, uh, first. Prepare it by having these random weights, train it in some manner such that we get a nice set of weights that can be reused by many tasks. More specifically, you start with an unlabeled corpus. So again, just a large corpus of text like all Wikipedia articles, but this text is not labeled. There is no human who looked at each one of the texts in this collection and said, this is anything. You just scrape it, you just take it and that's it, okay? And then um, you again have your randomly initialized transformer, but you are going to use a training objective that requires you to not, um, um, excuse me, to, to not um, label any of these data points. So what is your option? I intentionally moved slide before to not give away the answer. If you want to use some training objective that uh, doesn't require you to label any of these uh, texts, knowing what you know from this course, which kind of task would be a good idea. Want to say it out loud? Yeah. So do, do you have any specific task in mind? It's okay, it's not. I thought you are saying it quietly. Anyone else? Which task we introduced in this course where you do not need a human to tell you what the goal label is? Yes. Word. Yes, exactly. Next word prediction or next token prediction or language model, right? These are the same way to say, uh, different ways to say the same thing. So yeah, we have introduced a couple of weeks back language modeling where you assume that the gold label is whatever comes next in text, right? It's not, again, we said it's not necessarily true that other words cannot be used, but we will pretend that's the gold label at the given decoding step. So that's in one example how you can take a large collection of texts, terabytes of text, and train a transformer to predict the next word, right? And what's nice about language modeling is turns out to be able to predict what word comes next. You actually need to, your model needs to capture a lot of useful linguistic features, features that will be important not only for language modeling, but for many tasks uh, in NLP. Okay, it won't be able to off shell do all the tasks, we will need extra things, but it will capture in its weights a lot of useful information, such that when you start from those weights, rather than randomly initialized one, you are in a way better spot. So that's one option for what the pre-training objective is. The first one we are going to cover again uh, in uh, detail today. And then we're going to talk about mask uh, language modeling, which is another option that was popular at that time, 2018, 2019, uh, less so these days. Okay, so now, given that I told you that the whole point is to change random weights when you start training for supervised machine learning for your given task. Uh, what does change? What, what is going to change now uh, uh, when you 
when you're using this model for the downstream purposes. The only thing that's going to change is that you are going to take that model, that pre-trained model, and you're still going to have your label data and you're going to train it exactly as you would as you started with the random weights. So in terms of if you have written the code here and this network is exactly the same, let's say a transformer with the exact same hyperparameters as the network that's used for pre-training, your code, once you start supervised machine learning, literally doesn't change except the line of code where you load the weights, which now should load pre-trained weights rather than randomly initialized ones. Of course, it's important that the whole architecture stays the same, right? Because you can't replace matrix of size M by N with the matrix of size P by Q where M and P are different numbers, right? That doesn't make sense. But if they are the same models, you just continue uh, with your supervised uh, training. And this stage is called fine tuning because you are fine tuning those weights to specialize for the task. Okay, so now let's go into these uh, two kind of options for pre-training then fine-tuning paradigm. We were gonna start with the one which is more commonly used today, but if I was to teach this in a order that things have been introduced, um, we would start with the other option. So, uh, and I'm choosing this one to start with first because it's closer to what you know right now because we already introduced language modeling, so we are in a, in a better spot. Okay, so uh, the difference between these two options will be what training objective we use for pre-training. And then later at fine tuning stage, uh, with one option, you will literally not change the model. And with this other option, you will need to do one extra tweak of your model before you continue with supervised fine tuning. Okay, let's start with the option one. Imagine you have your decoder only GPT or encoder decoder transformer, for example, T5. Um, the only difference between these two uh, transformers is that this one has encoder and decoder the way we have talked about in the last lecture. This one ditches the encoder. And it's actually, if you are doing conditional text generation with decoder only, nothing really you know, super fancy happens. You just put your first token in your source sequence as the first token in decoder, and it does all the decoder computations. And that, yes, there is some layer to say what is the next prediction, um, but you ignore it. Like you don't need to use that information. It's there, but you choose to ignore it. So with a decoder only, you can use your decoder to, um, uh, to encode your source sequence, except the only difference now is that you don't need that cross attention because there is nothing to cross uh, to, right? There is no uh, encoder. Okay, so now we take one of these transformers, whichever we fancy, to pre-train it, meaning we are gonna start with the a large corpus of text that is deduplicated, filtered for quality and so on. Today we have a guest speaker. He will tell us more about what kind of, probably will tell us more about what kinds of things uh, people do uh, in these uh, steps. And you start with a randomly initialized transformer for pre-training, okay? And then in pre-training, you are training the model uh, with the language modeling objective, which basically says predict the next token, okay? Starting from some beginning of sequence token, you just predict what comes next. And we use the next token that actually appeared in our corpus next as the gold label for supervision. So at each token, next token prediction, we'll have loss uh, value. At the end of generating a particular piece of text, uh, let's say after 50 tokens, we can average these losses and back propagate. And we repeat this many, many, many times. So there is so much English on label data. When you, these days people scrape the entire internet. So the snapshot of the internet is massive, as you can imagine. Once you, you filter for the language, you're still left with ton of data. And usually you have so much data that not a single example is gonna be seen more than once. You can, you have an option that 
basically your batches of data are always different among each other, which is good because uh, it has been shown that if during pre-training a model sees an example many times, it's gonna memorize it token by token, and then later it can generate it token by token. Can someone tell me why this could be an issue? Yes. Maybe that's a good example to get this. It's the probability is so good that not the Sorry, that sequence probability is one. Yes. Yeah, potentially that's true. That's true. Um, what else could be an issue? Let's say this is definitely a possibility. That's bad, and hopefully never happens. But let's say. We use nucleus sampling so the model doesn't have a chance to always repeat the exact one. What, what still could be uh, an issue here? And let's think about on a society level, like a little bit beyond um, just the developer who is developing this. Where does this data come from? Oh, sorry, maybe you have an answer? Maybe it's just uh, changes. Oh, that's an, uh, definitely another um, another option, right? Like it's a, it's some rubbish and we are just repeating this rubbish. Um, I agree, yeah. Yeah, there is also that. Um, it is, uh, the question is more about memorization. Um, so if we memorize an example, of course, if this is very, you know, an example full of uh, biases or stereotypes or hate speech, and we have a hard time making the model not produce reproduce it, that's uh, definitely uh, an issue. But something particular, or memorization. Yep. We will have the problem of generalization for sure, right? Um, if the model is just memorizing something, it's not having the ability to reason, right? That's that's also true. You're having a ton of great examples, but still you didn't uh, give me the one that I had in mind. Do you post anything on the internet? Do you have a website? Yes, some people are nodding. And let's say your website is overrepresented in the data. And the model now is gonna repeat that website word by word, right? So there is an issue that now the model might just repeat all the things you have written. Maybe you have written really nice blog posts. You put a lot of effort and then the model without attributing your effort is going to write about things you have actually written. And this is what I had in mind. This is an issue that's related to copyright, right? Because this data scraped from the web contains a lot of creative uh, efforts as well. And because things have happened so quickly, some of these things will just be repeated verbatim. So maybe you have heard about comedians who are suing OpenAI, various other artists, New York Times issuing uh, OpenAI. So many lawsuits are just because uh, some examples have been memorized and repeated verbatim without attribution. You know how we teach you to never, never present us with a piece of writing without giving your source same, uh, you know, uh, moral approach is applied to these models. They should be attributing their sources. Okay, so now we just said uh, we are training our transformer to do next token prediction. So I want to zoom in in the final layer. Here, our final layer at every token at a given decoding step is uh, has a representation of that token at that position. And then we multiply that vector with a matrix whose number of columns is the number of tokens in the vocabulary such that we get the vector of the size of the vocabulary and then apply softmax to get the, the probability distribution of the over the vocabulary. Now, the nice thing about this kind of approach to pre-training is that you can then reuse this matrix because you can craft, uh, cast every single task as a sequence uh, generation task. As long as you can linearize output, you can generate it. So maybe your task is binary classification, and I have been teaching you to produce a matrix which has two columns because you have two classes. Instead, you can uh, train a model to generate words, positive or negative, 
for binary sentiment classification. And positive and negative should be tokens that are in this um, vocabulary. Or if not, we know that due, sub, due to subword tokenization, we'll still be able to produce a sequence of tokens that represents the label. So that's, a, that's how fine tuning a, a model that's uh, pre-trained with the language modeling objective works. You start with your pre-trained transformer model and which means that the weights of your transformer model are not random. They are now obtained through the pre-training procedure. You cast each task you have as text generation. And usually uh, tasks are then conditioned on something. Uh, there aren't many pure text generation tasks where you just start generating out of nowhere. And again, um, the, either using decoder only or encoder decoder, you can do this. Um, using encoder models are not typically done for next word uh, prediction. So once you do that, once you frame your data to be, let's say, in the, uh, in the, for the task of binary sentiment classification, your source sequence is a movie review. Your target is now a word representing that label, like positive or negative. So you're training the model to generate the tokens positive or negative. Important point to understand here is that we have a generation or next token prediction during pre-training and we have it during the fine tuning stage. So the output space is the same, which enables you to use this whole model you had uh, during pre-training without replacing any of its parameters. You can use this whole output layer the way it is, and you are just continuing fine tuning, training the model with new data, and you are changing the weights uh, in these uh, matrices, including all other weight matrices. But we will see in a moment why I'm emphasizing that this output layer stays uh, the same because in another approach, it, it, it won't, okay? So very little has changed, right? Like we have pre-trained the transformer with language modeling objective. We casted everything as a language modeling task. And we are just training the model given new label data to produce tokens that are corresponding to our labels. And that's it. We, instead of starting from randomly initialized weights, we start from the pre-trained ones. Now, there is an, another option for how to go about this, which has been, as I said, popular in 2018, 2019. Uh, at the time, that approach had worked better than this approach I have just told you, but then the, the, another switch had happened. This approach has been scaled, improved, and today uh, models that we have are mostly pre-trained and fine-tuned in this manner. But let's look into, uh, into this other option because it's still relevant to use these models and it's good to know how they were pre-trained. Okay, so instead of language modeling objective, in 2018, when a BERT model has been released, which had been one of the biggest uh, you know, releases in recent uh, history in NLP, they have pre-trained their transformer model, which was encoder-only transformer, by doing so-called mask language modeling, where you start with some piece of text. Here I have chosen some movie review, and then you mask some words randomly. Ignore the fact that I have actually not done this random, I have masked adjectives, uh, but anyway, like you just pick some 15% of input tokens and you replace them by some special token called mask. And now the task is, um, maybe you can tell me, I, I put this mask uh, text into my encoder, meaning that I will get a highly sophisticated token embedding for each one of these tokens as the output of the encoder, right? Uh, if the task is mask language modeling, can I just see a sense of whether anyone could guess what, then what the task would be? Just it's, it that doesn't matter if you don't know, it's just a guess, yeah. Generate a class. Uh, what would be a class here? Okay, 
So what did I say about uh, pre-training? What is important when we choose a training about the objective? What kind of objective are, are we using? What kind of data are we using? Uh -huh. And corpus itself, does it have labels? It doesn't have labels, right? So you can't do anything like sentiment classification here, right? Because you don't have labels. You have no idea what the sentiment is. I'm, you know, I'm giving an example of movie review, but this could be just a random article on Wikipedia or a piece of code from GitHub. Okay. Yeah, prediction. And can you specify just a little bit more? What, what kind of prediction are we doing? What are you predicting at the mask word? Yeah, the word, right? The one that's missing here. Like what could be this word, right? And again, we know which word is missing because we are the ones that replaced it by mask token. So we can assume that the word that have actually been there in the first place is our gold label, okay? So at each token, uh, at the output of the encoder is a token embedding for each token. And so it's a vector, and we have these vectors of these mask tokens, which are again contextualized. This one will be different from this one, from this one, because of self attention, right? Different importances at the different uh, positions. Okay, and then again, we are predicting which word could have appeared here. And we are again uh, assuming that whatever we have seen there at that position is the gold label. So our output layer is basically the same as what you have seen with language modeling, except that here we are using the vector, the, the representation produced by encoder at that position where the mass token is, that particular mass token. But everything else stays the same, right? Previously, this was a vector representation at the given decoder step. So very little has changed. And then yes, again, you assume that here the terrible was gold one uh, and so on. And for a given instance, you average all the losses of these mask tokens that you have introduced in that particular instance to be the loss for that instance. And then back propagate and change the transformer weights. Now, fine tuning works quite differently for um, mask language model, pre-trained models. Whereas before you just needed to cast your data as text generation, here you will do a few extra things. So very often with these models, there will be this special CLS token at the beginning and a special separator token at the end of the sequence. And the reason why these are introduced by the developers of these models, the, those that are pre-training them, is to um, embrace the fact that self-attention will make some, each vector contain a little bit of information of all the vectors in the, um, in the input sequence, judged by the importance for that token. However, if you introduce the CLS token already during pre-training, then the model learns that that uh, for that token, uh, all other tokens are important. And later you can use the representation of that token to represent your entire sequence instead of averaging. So that's one thing you do. Um, I mean, that's something that the uh, people who pre-train it do. So you do it at the fine tuning stage as well. And then unlike uh, uh, fine tuning language models, um, here, you will need to replace the output layer specifically. Let me go here. Your, okay, one view to see these kinds of models is you have input sequence, you have your embeddings, then you get token representation at each token, which you have seen last time with transformer. And then you can imagine, aha, uh -huh, okay, this first embedding representing the CLS token is my representation of the entire sequence. All you do at the top is introduce your logistic regression, meaning you, instead of reusing the output layer where you had the number of columns being the number of words in the vocabulary, here you are replacing that layer and introducing a layer, randomly initialized one, specialized for your task. So if we had binary classification, you would replace your massive matrix, which previously had the number of columns to be the size of vocabulary, to be only two. 
And this means that you can't use these models of shell for any task like you're using GPT-4. You usually need to fine tune these models with label data to have this, um, these matrices actually be learned and specialized for the task. Okay, everything else stays the same. You know how to do classification, right? Okay, so these kinds of models, they are usually encoder only models because you can do mask language modeling by looking only at the encoder representation and doing the prediction on top of them. Uh, and today, as I said, people don't typically train these kinds of models anymore, but those that are already trained can be quite useful. And they're particularly useful for text classification tasks because um, this mask language modeling objective basically is um, using the fact that certain tokens are highly indicative of what the whole sequence is about. So they're pretty good for text classification and they're not good for text generation. And because today everything is kind of generative, this is why they have kind of lost their momentum. But if you're doing text classification, Taking one of these and fine tuning it for your purpose, it's a, still to this day, a very good idea to try. Okay, so don't forget that because it's just because there are fancier and newer models, this might be sufficient for your purposes. And the fact that they are smaller, 304 million parameters instead of you know, dozens of billion, it's not necessarily a limitation. So it's still good to try this, if you have text classification task and if you have thousands of labeled examples. All right, so let me see where we are. Okay, just to wrap up this uh, part. So as I said, this is what had happened in 2018. And I just wanna mention that this was a major moment where there, is a, there was a huge improvement in many, um, in the performance of many tasks. So. Here, we haven't talked about all of these tasks, uh, so I don't wanna now cover what exactly they are, but know that each one of these is a special NLP tasks. And now by fine tuning BERT, you can see that here, pre-OpenAI state of the art, this means these are the models which were not pre-trained. Hi Kyle, I'll just wrap this up and then like I said. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so I was saying that if you compare the first row where you see the state of the art before we had uh, pre-training, and compare it with BERT large, you can see these massive uh, improvements. So that was quite quite uh, exciting when it happened. And uh, they have more results that show exactly the same thing, these massive improvements that came from pre-training. So this is why this was one of these, uh, these big moments in the recent uh, history. And since then, everyone has started with the pre-trained transformer and training transformer from scratch had been used only for very specialized applications where your pre-training data is very, very different from what you have during uh, 